Good day and uh, welcome to Glasnost in our time where we, we look at the world rationally in the hope that it'll look rationally back. I'm your host, Anthony D'Agostino. It's August 31st, 2023. Africa is swept by a wave of revolutionary action in preparation for war. Bonapartist, Nasserist, uh, and these are the terms I would use, military men in the Sahel countries are determined to expel the French clients from their governments and break up the French sphere of influence altogether in a series of military coups. France is at the end of its rope and trying to make war on the junta in Niger. A junta in Gabon has overthrown the son of Omar Bongo, a longtime client of the French who himself had just been elected to a third term. It's widely thought that this wave of revolutions is somehow inspired by the presence in the Sahel of Russian Wagner forces. So, to the war in Ukraine is now added a possible war in Africa. Perhaps these are the opening campaigns of World War III. We want everybody to slow down and preserve peace, but history doesn't seem to care about us. It wants revolution and war. So while we're hoping for the best, let's pause uh, to consider some events from the labor history of the United States. And for this, we have a distinguished social historian, Robert Cherney. He's the author of many books and articles, including a biography of William Jennings Bryan, textbook histories of the United States, of California, the San Francisco Bay Area. He's emeritus professor of history at San Francisco State. He has three books in the oven, uh, a study of the Coit Tower murals, I guess a follow-up to his study of Robert Arnotoff, the celebrated uh, um, uh, muralist um, uh, who has uh, contributed so much to the landscape in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, a history of San Francisco, a history of the communists in the Bay Area, uh, but currently he's hawking a biography of longshore labor leader Harry Bridges. Um, and this book just published this year, um, which comes with my high recommendation, wonderful, superb book, um, published by University of Illinois Press. And we want to hear more about it today. So welcome to Glasnost, Bob Cherney. Thanks, Tony. And, and thanks for those uh, nice words about my book. Well, um, yeah, let's talk about this book today. Most of my generation gets its impressions about the waterfront from uh, Elia Kazan's great film uh, On the Waterfront, which I've seen many times, has Marlon Brando in it. It has uh, several of the Italian fighters uh, who fought uh, Joe Lewis and were knocked out by Joe, uh, Tammy Moriello and Tony Galento. These are not big names anymore, but at one time we knew about these fellas. They were menacing, hulking Italian American mafia type characters. The Longshore Union in that film was depicted uh, as being run by a bunch of gangsters, basically. And the men had to shape up every day uh, to get their work tokens. Uh, that was the system that Harry Bridges, uh, the person that you have devoted so many years to studying, that was the system that he overthrew. And so you tell that story. Um, but you say that the the story of Harry Bridges is really is really three stories. So how is that? Well, there there are really, as as you said, there are really three stories about Harry Bridges. Uh, one story is that he was a communist, and that's the most important thing to know about him. There's another one that says he was not a communist, but there were unstinting efforts by employers and people on the right, uh, the American Legion, the Immigration Service, to claim that he was a communist so he could be deported. And the third story is that Harry Bridges was a remarkably effective leader of a really unusual union. And that third story is the one that I concentrate on in the book. There are some elements of truth in all of those stories, in fact. Bridges was very close to the Communist Party. And in the book, uh, I 
I found it difficult to give a yes or no answer to the question, was Harry Bridges a communist? Whenever people have asked me that question, I've said, you're not going to be happy with my answer, because the answer is that it was a complicated relationship. He was close to the party. He may have even been on a party committee at times. But it's clear from my research that he was never given orders by the party. I don't think he ever paid dues or carried a party membership card. He was certainly never under party discipline. So he was close to the party, but the party didn't control Harry. And, uh, and it was very clear that as often as not, the party followed his lead rather than him following the party line. Hmm. Nonetheless, being that close to the party did set him up in, in, in some real danger. Because in the 1930s, when he first came to prominence, he was not a citizen. He was born in Australia, came to the US in 1922, worked on the San Francisco docks, delayed getting his citizenship in order so that by the time he became prominent as a union leader, he was still not a citizen. And in the previous 20 years or more, deporting an effective union leader was something that had happened again and again. It, it became a convenient way to get rid of, of an effective union leader, claiming that the person is a communist or an anarchist or one of the other categories that was subject to deportation uh, if it could be proven. And so a whole raft of groups in the 1930s set out to prove that Bridges was a communist and could be deported. Uh, some of it was funded by employers. Some of it sprang from the American Legion. Uh, some of it came from uh, kind of rogue immigration service officers in Portland. Uh, but the key figure in the 1930s for all of this was the Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins. And Frances Perkins said in one of her uh, interviews, uh, later interviews, that she knew that this had been, that this tactic had been used in the 1920s to get rid of effective labor leaders, and that she wasn't going to let it happen on her watch. Uh, but but they kept, these groups kept producing evidence, evidence in quotes, uh, that Bridges was a communist. And at one point, there was even an effort to impeach Perkins for protecting Bridges. And at that point, Bridges told her, go ahead, hold a hearing. I know what's going on. I've got evidence that all of this is phony. I can, you save yourself let me save myself. And so she finally called a hearing in 1939. And in fact, Bridges and his lawyers revealed that a lot of this evidence was either perjury or outright forgery. And the hearing officer found in Bridges' favor. Uh, but that didn't end it. Uh, that didn't end it. What happened at that point was that a bill was introduced in Congress to deport Harry Bridges by name, which of course is unconstitutional. It's a bill of attainder. The Congress is prohibited by the Constitution from passing a law that applies to just one person. Uh, and President Roosevelt and Attorney General Robert Jackson knew it was unconstitutional, but it, by then it was 1940, presidential election year, Roosevelt was coming up to an unprecedented third term. And he didn't want to be in the position of either vetoing that bill or signing that bill. So he told the attorney general to go talk to some guys in the Senate and kill the bill in the Senate, which Jackson did. But uh, there was a quid pro quo. He had to order a new investigation of Bridges and this time have the FBI do the investigation. Hmm. And the Immigration Service was moved out of the Labor Department and into the Justice Department 
so that Francis Perkins would no longer have any say in what was going on, and it would be the attorney general who would be making the key decisions. So 1941, there was another hearing, and that hearing went against Bridges and had to be appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, reached the Supreme Court in 1945, which found in Bridges' favor. And so he became a citizen at that point. Hmm. But 1949, there's a rise in anti-communism in the Truman administration, more generally across the country. McCarthy was about to begin his tirades. And in 1949, the Immigration Service opened up a new investigation uh, in, against Bridges. And they claimed that he had perjured himself when he became a citizen, when he said that he was not a communist. Um, now, 1949, that was four years after he'd become a citizen and the statute of limitations on perjury had run out. So the Justice Department lawyers had to find some other way of, uh, of making this claim. So they came up with a law that extended the statute of limitations on defrauding the government, a, a wartime law. So they essentially argued that Bridges had defrauded the government out of his, out of his citizenship. Uh, and, but they really then focused on perjury. That was the whole basis for that 1949 lawsuit, claiming that he had perjured himself when he had become a citizen. And that went against Bridges and had to be appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, at which point the U.S. Supreme Court said, that law doesn't apply to citizenship cases. That law was all about defrauding the government out of money, not out of a citizenship. You can't use that law uh, against Bridges. Very what, narrow. What, what year was that, Bob? Uh, that, that, that Supreme Court decision was 1954. Uh -huh. And so at that point, they brought another case against Bridges, fourth time, this time claiming that uh, the, the previous one had been a criminal conspiracy charge. This time they made it a civil conspiracy charge, again, claiming he had defrauded the government out of citizenship. It came to trial in San Francisco in 1955. The judge at the time essentially said to the Justice Department lawyers, don't you guys have anything better to do? You know, this is just all phony. Get out of my court. <laughs> and that was the end of it. That was the end of 20 years of efforts to deport Bridges. Hmm. And here's the deep irony in all of that history. Australia had made it clear to the U.S. government in 1939, when this all started at the federal level, the Australian government made it clear that they would not accept him if he were deported. So uh -huh. what were these trials all about? Well, in one sense, they were show trials. But in another sense, they were a real threat because even though he might not have been deported, if Australia wouldn't accept him, he would have come under sanctions, federal sanctions. He might have been uh, imprisoned because some people in that situation were just kept in some kind of confinement. He certainly would have been removed from his union leadership uh, under some sort of, of federal confinement. Uh, so there would have been a, a, a very real penalty uh, if he had lost one of those cases. Hmm. But at any rate, all that came to an end in 1955. Hmm. Now, to go back to the on the waterfront scene of the shape up, you know, that, that was what Bridges, that was where Bridges made his reputation in fighting the shape up in 1934. So let's, you want me to, continue with that discussion. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, don't we, uh, why don't we talk about the movie? <laughs> okay, well, the movie, of course, is about New York. The movie is about the New York waterfront 
uh, the way in which the International Longshoremen's Association, which was the real union that was involved there, the name of the re actual union on the waterfront, the way in which it was uh, controlled uh, from a, a very authoritarian president. And, you know, my memory of the movie is not that good, and I don't really think they actually name names, but at the time... They said John, Johnny Friendly. Yeah, well... <laughs> that, was, that was Joe Ryan, I suppose. That was Joe Ryan. <laughs> Joe Ryan was the head of the International Longshoremen's Association from uh, the late 1920s up into the mid-1950s. He was known as King Ryan because of the kind of absolute control he kept over that union. And his control in New York was really based on the shape up. Now, here's how the shape out worked for the, the, those of your listeners who don't recall this. If you wanted to work as a longshoreman, you would go to a, a hiring point. It wasn't a hiring hall, but it, it would be uh, somewhere near the docks. They, they would have a, a location for the shape up every morning. In San Francisco, the shape up started at 7 a.m. in front of the ferry building. And in New York, there was more than one location for the shape up because there was so, such a, a much larger waterfront in New York, in both Manhattan and, and Brooklyn. Um, but if you wanted to work, you went to the shape up. And at the shape up, gang bosses would circulate around and pick out their gang for the day. A gang boss was, was <clears throat> a gang boss was in charge of the loading or unloading of one hold of a ship. And a typical hold gang was maybe as many as 18 men. Half of them would work in the hold, half of them would work on the dock. And they'd be either loading things into the ship or unloading things from the ship. The gang boss was in charge of the hold. So uh, in New York, the shape up was used in especially to weed out anyone who was challenging the control of King Ryan. Uh, and in Brooklyn, many of these uh, longshore locals had been infiltrated by the mafia. So they were also using the shape up to maintain their control uh, and, and perhaps to, you know, to weed out anyone who was challenging their control. Uh, it was very dangerous to be challenging the organization uh, in New York at that time, as, as is made very clear in, in the movie. Now in San Francisco, it was, a, it was a different situation in a couple of ways. First of all, in San Francisco, the shape up was used uh, to weed out anyone who opposed the union as it existed at the time before 1933. There was a union of sorts on the San Francisco docks. It wasn't anything like the union that existed in New York. It was a, an organization that had come into existence in 1919 when there was a big strike in San Francisco, a longshore strike, uh, that ended with the defeat of the previous union. Uh, and the implementation of what was called on the docks the Blue Book Union because their dues book was blue. And it was the Blue Book Union had been created by a bunch of gang bosses uh, in 1919 who went to the employers. The employers were organized in the Waterfront Employers Union. Uh, and, and they went to the employers and said, look, uh, you know, sign a, a contract with us. It'll end the strike uh, and we'll keep those men in line. Uh, that was that was the role of the Blue Book Union, to keep the men in line, essentially, and to collect dues because the men who controlled the Blue Book Union had to be paid and they, they collected dues in order to work on the docks in San Francisco in the 1920s and early 1930s. You had to keep your dues paid up because the Blue Book officers, the Blue Book business agents could uh, keep you out of the shape up, could keep you from getting a job. So the shape up worked to keep that union in power, but it wasn't 
you know, it wasn't a, a, a mafia controlled union the way, way it, it existed in New York. It was just really a racket, a racket that that uh, kept the uh, officers of that union uh, uh, getting paid. And they periodically negotiated contracts with the waterfront employers, and they had wages that were not terrible. Uh, if you translate the wages then to modern buying power, it would be roughly minimum wage. But minimum wage for doing some of the most difficult and dangerous work anywhere in the country. Longshoring was a very dangerous occupation then because I told you what they did. They lifted cargo up from the dock and down into the hold in a sling. And if that sling load should break apart, it could the things in it could fall on the men below or on the men on the dock. And injury or death from falling objects was just a commonplace on the docks everywhere in the country. Longshoring in the 1920s was the second most dangerous occupation in the country, next only to mining. Uh, so it's difficult work dangerous work, uh, very hard physical labor, and with absolutely no benefits and no job security, because hiring through the shape up was hiring for the day or for the, for the job. Uh, the hours of work could be really long. Uh, you were hired to work for the day, and sometimes, this was not typical, but it was not unknown, Sometimes that day could be a 24 hour shift uh, and, and there was nothing to prevent that. The union just, uh, you know, did not in any way enforce working conditions. So that was the situation when Bridges began working on the docks in 1922. And in 1933, there were efforts to revive a union. Uh, Bridges had tried, not in a leadership position, but, but Bridges had at least signed up for a couple of efforts to revive a, a real union during the 1920s, and all he'd gotten for it was being blacklisted. Uh, and he had to really try to avoid the Blue Book Business Agency even to work uh, at times in the 1920s. Um, but in 1933, there were some important changes. One change was new legislation, the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933, which set up the National Recovery Administration, which set out to establish codes of fair work practices, among many other things, uh, for each industry. And uh, as a result of this federal legislation, for the first time in peacetime, American workers were guaranteed the right to belong to a union of their own choosing. Now, there had been something like that during World War I, but this is really the first time in peacetime that the federal government is giving that kind of a guarantee. And it was, of course, a, a rather vague guarantee. It had to be what it really meant had to be worked out in practice. And uh, so there, there, were, there was an effort to revive the Union all up and down the Pacific Coast. Uh, in the 1920s, it had been wiped out everywhere but in Tacoma. And uh, what the people in Tacoma did was to take the lead in reviving unions in all the Pacific Coast ports. Now, the International Longshoremen's Association had previously had local unions in most of the Pacific Coast ports. And the Pacific Coast ports were part of an autonomous district within the ILA, the, the Pacific Coast District. And that's important um, because they then set out to develop a coast-wise approach to bargaining. And before Bridges became involved in the union at all, uh, the Tacoma guys, and the ones who were involved in this first round of organizing set out a few key demands that they wanted 
either through NRA code or through collective bargaining. And the most important of those was a union hiring hall, which would dispatch workers in such a way that it would give all union members roughly the same amount of work over a month's time. You know, there'd be no favoritism. Uh, instead, if you were a union member and were dispatched from the union hiring hall, uh, the principle that they later established was low man out. The man who had worked the fewest hours had the first shot at a job as a way of equalizing earnings among all the members of the union. And, and this got what was intended to get rid of the, of the hiring hall, of the shape up and replace it with a union hiring hall, with a union dispatcher. That was just a key element in what they were asking for. And they also wanted improvement in wages. They asked for a six hour day. Uh, they thought that a six hour day would be a way of sharing the available work in the time of, uh, of the Great Depression, because we're now in 1930s, we're in the middle of the Great Depression, and there were more men seeking work than there was work available. So a six hour day was a way, again, of equalizing earnings by creating more jobs. Um, those were the key demands that they set out. And by the time Bridges began to be involved in union leadership, those demands had already been uh, created and had already been presented to the shipping companies, to the waterfront employers. As you say in the book, um, uh, Harry reflected, Harry Bridges reflected later uh, that, um, you know, he didn't... Uh, he didn't do much that, you know, self-deprecating, but he said he didn't, he didn't do much. He was just uh, basically uh, thrown into the position of leadership and uh, because nobody else wanted to do it. That's the way he explained being elected as chair of the strike committee. Yeah. And I've looked at the minutes of that meeting, you know, the, the San Francisco local uh, set up a strike committee, a large strike committee with uh, people chosen from each who worked on each of the of the docks. So it was, you know, I don't know, 100 men or so on the strike committee. And when it came time to elect a chair, nobody else than Bridges was nominated. He was the only one nominated. And so he took it. <laughs> now, I think he probably wanted it. <laughs> um, well, 1934 was a, a kind of a big year. You have a number of big strikes. You have the San Francisco uh, uh, dock strike and general turned into a general strike. Yes. You have a, uh, a teamster strike uh, 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 led by Trotskyists in uh, in uh, Minneapolis, I believe it was, uh, yeah. which is uh, more or less the basis of the uh, teamster union. And there were a couple of other ones, Toledo Auto Light, I believe. There was yep. a big yep. strike, a whole series of strikes that end all this legislation, the NRA Section 7A and then after the NRA became um, uh, unconstitutional uh, by the uh, order of the Supreme Court, uh, the Wagner Act. So this is the, the beginning of what you might call industrial unionism in the United States appearing for the first time. If you compare that to Europe, uh, the United States is about 30 years behind the <laughs> Europeans. You know, most of those events that we're thinking about with those big unions forming big, uh, um, you know, uh, big agglomerations, um, that occurs in Europe in uh, the 1880s, the 1890. You know, the London dock strike in 1889 is the big event for the British trade unions. This is, this is a whole generation earlier. So the United States, in a certain sense, is uh, behind all of the rest yeah. of the world in this regard. No, that's so. You know, the 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 labor movement, such as it was in the United States, uh, had very few examples of successful industrial unions before the 1930s. Uh, the more typical pattern for union organization was unionization by trade uh, and, and skill, really by skill. So uh, carpenters had their own union, separate from plumbers, separate from painters. You know, the whole construction industry had all these separate unions. The railroad industry had separate unions for engineers and brakemen and conductors and flagmen and so forth. You know, uh, the the union movement was was in that way very decentralized, opposed to large corporations 
uh, that uh, could bring much more, many more resources to bear in opposing unions than what the unions could bring to bear in support. Uh, you know, when Harry Bridges became head of a of a, um, a very active longshore, a very politically active longshore union um, on the west on the west coast, the question emerges. I think uh, wh what his relations were with the other labor leaders, and I've always been curious about John L. Lewis. Well, for one thing, uh, neither Harry nor John L. Lewis uh, got along very well with Roosevelt, and and, and uh, when Roosevelt ran for a third term. In uh, 1940, they were both against Roosevelt. Uh, what was it? What were the relations between uh, um, uh, Bridges and uh, people like uh, like John L. Lewis? Well, at, initially they were quite good. Um, in in uh, you know to give the background on John L. Lewis, John L. Lewis came out of the coal miners' union, uh, and it was in, organized on an industrial model. Uh, it was one of the few industrial unions uh, that had managed to hold on to its jurisdiction. Uh, and in 1934, Lewis, in the National Convention of the American Federation of Labor, argued that the union movement had to turn to industrial organizing. Uh, they had to take advantage of the opportunity that they had through uh, a favorable uh, presidential administration and to begin to organize on an industrial basis. And this was, was really controversial within the AFL. Uh, the old craft unions, the carpenters and all the rest of them were very much opposed to this model of organizing. And so they rather grudgingly told Lewis, okay, you can have a committee on industrial organizing but they they didn't really um, expect it to go anywhere. That that's clear. Uh, so the original CIO was the Committee on Industrial Organization, led by Lewis. Lewis poured money into this, and set out to organize some of the major mass production industries, especially automobile and steel. And of course, coal is crucial to steel and steel is crucial to automobiles. So you get a little bit of the, you know, the chain of economic uh, integration involved here with the way Lewis is, is picking his, his first targets. Now, by 1936, the CIO had become a really important political force, and, and Lewis had given a ton of money to the Roosevelt campaign for re-election in 1936. Everyone expected that election to be very close. All the polls showed that, that the Republican candidate might, might well win. And Roosevelt surprised everyone by this landslide victory in which he took all but two states. Uh, and Lewis had played a significant role in, in pushing Roosevelt to, uh, to re-election and expected to get something out of it, of course, in terms of some favorable federal uh, decisions. But, uh, at, and, and Lewis, however, was increasingly on the outs with the AFL leadership over his successes. And in 1937, he broke away. He, he broke away from the AFL and converted the CIO into the Congress of Industrial Organizations, and he began issuing charters to industrial unions. Um, by that point, on the Pacific Coast, Bridges had moved from being chair of the strike committee in San Francisco to president of the San Francisco local to president of the Pacific Coast District. Uh, and he had uh, not only led the San Francisco local in the 1934 strike, he had led the Pacific Coast District in another major strike in 1936 37. Uh, and, and so in uh, mid 1937, uh, he began discussions with Lewis. And as a result of those discussions, there was a vote among all ILA members on the, in the Pacific Coast District. And the vote came out overwhelmingly to leave the ILA and to accept a CIO charter as a separate union. Because 
the relations between the Pacific Coast District and, and King Ryan in New York had been, to say the least, extremely thorny. Uh, Ryan had been totally uncooperative uh, in, in giving them any kind of support because they'd begun looking to expand, to expand from the docks to the warehouses, to expand from, from longshoring to other, uh, other occupations uh, in the ports, and especially to charter locals in Hawaii, uh, to bring Hawaii into the Pacific Coast District. Ryan had just been unsupportive uh, in all of those moves. So there was, there were good solid reasons why the West Coast Longshoremen wanted to get out of the ILA. Uh, and so they voted to disaffiliate and to join the CIO. Lewis gave them a charter. Bridges became the founding president of the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union. And he was appointed as the Western Regional Director for the CIO. And some of the first things they did was charter locals in Hawaii so that they could bring Hawaii into uh, the Pacific Coast uh, Union. And, and, you know, there's an economic logic for that in, in terms of organizing, extending their union organization to Hawaii, because San Francisco was the major port for goods being shipped to and from Hawaii. Uh, and uh, it, it, those goods included all kinds of, of finished goods going to Hawaii, but raw sugar coming to the Bay Area where the major sugar refinery still exists uh, at, at, on Carquinez Straits, the CNH refinery. So what they were doing was following that chain of economic integration uh, and by beginning to organize on the docks in Hawaii. And to jump ahead a bit in the story, what they eventually did in Hawaii was to follow that chain of vertical integration all the way from the docks through the railroad, through the kind of railroad lines that existed to the fields, to organizing sugar and pineapple field workers in Hawaii. Where, so that by uh, the mid 1940s, the ILWU had really become the first successful union to organize agricultural workers on a long-term basis. Uh, so they're they're getting they're moving from the docks and really creating an industrial model here in a way that Lewis and anyone else probably had never quite anticipated. So um, what are the role of the communists in all of this? Uh, let me see that's not a that's not a very good question because it's uh, kind of a <laughs> essay question, it would probably take another several hours to really uh, explore that. I have to ask you a question that has a short answer. Now, let's see. Um, how about the um, uh, the textile uh, and um, clothing workers? Um, how did they figure in this uh, push and pull between the AFL and the CIO? David Dubinsky and Sidney Hillman uh, had a lot of influence with, uh, with Roosevelt and Francis Perkins. Uh, where, how, what's their relationship in this, um, um, how, how to put it, tension between the AFL and the CIO, which I guess was never really completely uh, resolved until 1955, would you say? Uh, no, I think that's right. Uh, and, you know, in terms of, uh, Bridges really didn't get involved much with any of that, uh, in fact. Uh, he, 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 most of that was going on in the East, you know, the con conflict between Dubinsky and Hillman and, and their respective unions, both of which were really following an industrial model by, by the 1930s. Uh, but um, that, that didn't uh, have much play in the West Coast. What it did was mostly in Los Angeles, because whatever uh, manufacturing there was along those lines in the West Coast, tended to be more in Los Angeles. There was a bit in San Francisco, uh, but, but much more in Los Angeles. So let me ask you about the politics of, the, uh, of, of all these unions, and especially about the longshore politics. So he was a big supporter of Roosevelt, one can assume, uh, in the 30s, but not so in 1940. So right, right. automatically, we associate that with the Hitler-Stalin pact and with the, the fact that the Soviet Union was sitting out the beginning of 
World War, well, so was the United States, as a matter of fact, uh, sitting out the beginning of World War, World War II. Um, uh, but um, when did he rally? When he, with, at Pearl Harbor? Uh, yeah, no, uh, Bridges and Lewis, from very different political standpoints, both opposed Roosevelt in 1940. You know, Bridges really followed the party line at that point in opposing the, the re-election of, of Roosevelt. Lewis, Lewis was always kind of a Republican. <laughs> and in 1940, he had not been getting as much from the Roosevelt administration as he thought that he needed and he did support the, the uh, Republican candidate in 1940. Bridges didn't do that. Bridges didn't support Wendell Wilkie in 1940 the way Lewis did. Bridges just said, don't vote for Roosevelt. And his own local voted against him on that and voted to endorse Roosevelt. So in that way, you know, we really see how little influence Bridges very left leanings, his his communist leanings, uh, what were could carry over into some union matters. Yeah, you stress you stress this uh, throughout the book uh, that uh, frequently uh, Harry Bridges has a position of one sort or another, and uh, he finds out that the rank and file feel completely differently about it. And the rank and file seem rather steady, <laughs> whereas there are some fluctuations in Harry's uh, Harry's views of. Uh, of things, uh, but he always tends to uh, rally to the. I'm generalizing uh, over a number of things, but uh, he uh, Bridges generally rallied to the rank and file point of view, didn't didn't he? Exactly, and and um, I think that experience in the 1940 election really stands out as pretty unusual. Uh, both both that he was taking a position that was so different from from his own members and the way in which his members voted against his advice. That, that's pretty unusual. You know, at the time that Bridges died, uh, uh, there was a journalist uh, who had been following Bridges' career very closely who said something like, um, his genius was in fusing the rank and file with the leadership. And Bridges, as his... Uh, presidency developed, institutionalized a number of ways to fuse the rank and file with the leadership in a way that uh, I think kept him well informed of what the rank and file thought, but also kept the rank and file very informed of everything that was going on. And, and here's, here's the crucial institutionalization of that for longshore workers. When a longshore contract was coming up for negotiations when uh, contracts were expiring and it was time to renegotiate. They'd call a Longshore Caucus. The Longshore Caucus consisted of elected delegates from every Longshore local, uh, so that uh, a typical Longshore Caucus would probably have more than 100 delegates present. And they would spend as much time as it took to discuss every aspect of the contract. Each of those delegates came to the caucus with instructions from their local, so that there would have been a local meeting, they discussed the contract, they'd elect their delegates, the delegates would come to the caucus with these instructions, and then there'd be long discussions in the caucus over what they were going to ask for uh, in, in negotiations. And then the caucus elected a bargaining committee, and it was usually a fairly good-sized committee, 8, 10, 12 people, with regional representation from the largest locals, from small locals, from clerks, as well as longshoremen, and so forth. Uh, and that negotiating committee was present Bridges always led the negotiations. Bridges led the discussions in the caucus. Bridges led the negotiations, to be sure. But he always had these representatives of the rank and file uh, involved. And at one key bargaining issue, when they were negotiating the m, &M agreement, the modernization and mechanization agreement that led to containerization, Bridges had what he called 
fishbowl negotiations in which the entire Longshore Caucus, all hundred plus of them, were in an auditorium to watch everything going on in the negotiations so that there were no secret deals being made. That is extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And, and they weren't allowed to say anything. They could watch. And yep. then they'd take periodic breaks, stop the negotiating, meet with the caucus, take all their questions, discuss with them what's going on, where we go next. Uh, it's really a remarkable involvement of the rank and file with the leadership. And I, I don't know of examples from other large unions where anything quite like that uh, has existed. Um, this is um, such an interesting point uh, about the, uh, the innards of the, uh, of the union po uh, policies and what you might think of as union, union democracy, if that isn't too pretentious, uh, pretentious a term. Sometimes I think that, exactly, term, exactly that, term right. a, that term is a whopper. Uh, but and let me ask you a, a question that may seem a little bit off the beaten track. Uh, how about this Japanese relocation during World War II? What was the position that Harry Bridges took on that? Well, we're talking about events in 19, early 1942, uh, where uh, Roosevelt issued an executive order that any enemy national could be removed from military districts. And the whole Pacific coast was a military district. And so it remained to be determined who would actually be removed. But everyone knew that the Japanese were going to be a major target, uh, both Japanese nationals and their children. I mean, they, there was no distinctions made. There was a congressional committee that held hearings up and down the coast, the Toland Committee, to, to decide how to implement this executive order. Uh, and there were all kinds of heavyweights who came in, Attorney General, um, uh, the Attorney General of California came in and said, you know, that all the Japanese needed to be relocated. That was Earl Warren, by the way, uh, who, who came in and made that, uh, that argument. And there were a, a very few voices that said no. Interestingly enough, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI was one of those voices, but he didn't speak up at the time. He just said, we know who the potential problems are. You don't need to take everybody. Just let leave it to us. Leave it to us. But, you know, that was the advice he was giving in Washington. What happened in the Toland Committee in San Francisco was that the CIO Industrial Union Council for California held a meeting. And, and, you know, this is really Bridges Committee. Bridges is, you know, it's the most significant union that's involved in this. And what they said was, we're opposed to relocating all the Japanese because it's a form of war hysteria that we won't go along with. But Bridges is on trial. <laughs> Bridges is appealing his, his sentence. We don't want him to make the announcement. We're going to send Lou Goldblatt, who was a secretary treasurer of the Industrial Union Council. And so Goldblatt spoke to the Toland Committee and said, don't do make any decisions based on ancestry. That's simply hysteria. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. the committee didn't pay any attention to that. He was a very lonely voice. Uh, the Communist Party said, went along with relocation. Um, most unions went along with relocation. Mm -hmm. Throughout the war, uh, the ILWU newspaper singled out Japanese Americans who were in the military or who were otherwise involved in supporting the war to give them publicity in the newspaper and to show that Japanese Americans were good citizens. Mm -hmm. At the end of the war, there was a lot of discrimination against the Japanese Americans who were being released from the camps. And there was an ILWU local in Stockton, which uh, did not, a, a warehouse local, uh, which was discriminating against uh, a Japanese American. And at that point, Bridges went to Stockton and ripped their charter off the wall and required that every member of that local had to sign a statement of non-discrimination 
And if they wouldn't sign, they were out of the union. Uh, so Bridges was very good on all of this. Bridges and the union more generally were very good on the whole Japanese relocation issue. Hmm. But this, then, you see, that, it, I'm let, sorry, go ahead, Bob. let me tell you how this really fits with the whole history of that union. From the very beginning, one of the things that Bridges Caucus, beginning in 1933, said, there can be no discrimination if we're going to be a successful union. No discrimination on the basis of race. No discrimination based on religion or politics or any other uh, aspect that the that what we and, and then the subtext of this is, of course, what we want is the solidarity of working people, which is a fundamental principle of the ILWU. The fundamental uh, the ILWU has 10 guiding principles that were developed by Bridges and other international officers in the early 1950s. And it's still a central to, to that union. And if you had to generalize about all 10 of those guiding principles, it is no discrimination and the solidarity of all working people here and around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, uh, uh, Bridges was uh, on and off with Roosevelt, but mostly on, I think we have to say. Um, Bridges was, uh, I guess he's an opponent of the Cold War. He's against um, uh, the Taft-Hartley. He's, uh, he's against the Marshall Plan. Um, yeah. he's, um, he's against the Korean War. Um, but he's kind of sympathetic toward the Hungarian Revolution in uh, 1956, was he not? Um, what he said was that uh, it, it, was a, a, it was opposed to the Soviet troops coming in to suppress what was going on in Hungary. You know, come Hungary. Uh, it was against the Soviet intervention. Yeah, he, he was opposed to the Soviet military intervention, which was really bloody and, and, and uh, it just really devastating. Um, Bridges said, you know, people have a right to choose who they want, which, again, is a fundamental principle of his union, that yeah. the rank and file have a right to elect whoever they want. People in another country have a right to choose who they want their leaders to be. So by that point, though, uh, Bridges had kind of cooled on, on the Communist Party, uh, and I think that cooling had come in part from those events you referred to uh, in 1947-48. In so you want to revisit those for a moment? Let, let me just... Um, and, you know, I was going to ask you a couple of other questions. If you don't mind, uh, perhaps we can press on slightly. I was going to ask you about the Kennedys. Um, now he has a kind of an on and off relationship with the Kennedys. Does he? Does he not? I mean, the, as a matter of fact, the Kennedys uh, were regarded by Harry Bridges as enemies of of, yes. of the labor movement, right? Yes, he did. Now, and why? Uh, in the late 1950s, there was a Senate investigating committee that looked especially at racketeering in unions. And they, they focused on the Teamsters. They focused on the ILA. John F. Kennedy was a member of that committee. Robert Kennedy was the consul to that committee and one of their chief interrogators. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, played a significant role in the development of legislation coming out of that committee, the Landrum-Griffin Act. And Bridges saw that legislation. Did the Landrum-Griffin Act make it illegal to be a communist? Uh, it, no, uh, wait a minute. I didn't. I put didn't put that right. Um, make it uh, illegal for a communist to run a trade union. Yes, exactly. The Landrum Griffin Act made it illegal for a communist to hold office in a union. Exactly, hmm. and put a lot of other restrictions. Is that, is that still the case? Uh, no, no, it is not, and it is not the case because of an event in San Francisco in Local Ten. Huh. Where in the late 1950s, Archie Brown, an open avowed communist who had fought in the Abraham Lincoln Battalion in Spain and was the spokesman for the Communist Party, had been elected to the Local 10 Executive Committee. And 
after the Landrum Griffin Act was passed with this provision that a communist cannot hold office in a union, uh, Bridges was told by the Justice Department, you have a communist in your union, you should do something about this. Uh, and Bridges essentially said, I didn't, I, I have no control over who the rank and file elect, you know, I, I have no control. Uh, and so Attorney General Robert Kennedy had Archie Brown arrested and held a big, big press conference in Washington and made clear this is a test case. We are going to go after every communist in every union. Uh, and Bridges and the union gave full support to Brown. They made clear that they weren't supporting his politics, that, that what they were supporting was the right of the union to elect any officer that the members of the union chose. And they assigned the union's lawyers, who were well experienced with Supreme Court appeals <laughs> by this point, they assigned the union lawyers to defend Archie Brown. Archie Brown's case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, well, it went first to the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, no, that provision of the Landrum Griffin Act violates the First and the Fifth Amendments to the Constitution, and therefore that is unconstitutional. The federal government appealed that all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, uh, led by Earl Warren now, did not disagree with the circuit court, but Earl Warren laid on another whole layer of opinion to say that it also violated the bill of attainder provision of the Constitution itself, of Article I of the Constitution, and, and that therefore this provision was unconstitutional on multiple grounds. And it, it really set an, a, an important precedent in terms of the use of the bill of attainder provision in Article I of the Constitution. What, what, what year was that, Bob? Pardon? What year was that? What year was that? Um, the, the 1963, 64, I don't know. It, it's, it's early 60s. Early, early, early 60s. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we're running out of time and uh, there, I have a whole string of other things I wanted to ask you about. And I'm, I just, I'm drinking, drinking this all in and loving it. Um, I, I, maybe I could ask you one or two more questions. Uh, maybe a, um, a, uh, uh, an easy question and a hard one. Uh, uh, maybe I could ask you um, about um, uh, uh, events in the Soviet Union uh, during uh, the Gorbachev period. How did Harry Bridges feel about that? And uh, lastly, I wanted you to generalize about the place of uh, industrial trade unionism in the progressive uh, tradition in the United States. Um, and I hope we have time for both the answers to these questions. Let me ask you the first one. How do you feel about Gorbachev? Well, um, you know, he was really at the end of his life by that point. Uh, what what year did Gorbachev come to power? 1985. Uh, 85. 85. Um, and I don't, you know, he didn't comment that much about Gorbachev, but what he did comment about was what was happening in Poland with the solidarity oh, movement in Poland. Yeah. Uh, by that point, I was interviewing him. By this that point, I was beginning my research, and I I remember him saying something about, uh, you know, this whole solidarity thing, that's just all a tool of the Catholic Church, uh, because he he had no love for the Catholic Church. But he also, I think, knew that this was a serious challenge uh, to the Communist Party uh, in Poland and, and probably more generally. Hmm. How about then, um, uh, you know, you're, a, you're a, uh, a, a historian of the progressive movement. In fact, uh, you used to um, uh, be the editor of a, of a listserv uh, that more or less uh, was a kind of a forum for all of the historians of the progressive movement. So you were, uh, I mean, I can certainly ask you this question, um, um, but, it, but it requires a big answer, a big generalizing answer. I mean, where do you put, you know, looking at it as an American historian over the decades and, you know, long generations uh, uh, of time, what is the relationship of industrial trade unionism to progressivism in the U.S. tradition? Oh, wow. Well, that is a big question. <laughs> and, um, but it's your 
but it's your field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not a question that I have addressed, Tony. So uh, let me meander a little bit. Um, you know, when I think about progressivism, you yeah. know, it's a very big and rather fluid concept. Um, there, there have even been historians who have argued that it is so big and fluid, you cannot point to any one progressive movement because there's so much going on in so many parts of-, of But that happens with almost every historical topic and historians are gonna end up saying that about a lot of things. Yes, because it's all too complicated. There's so much to it. There's so many doctoral dissertations. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It saves us from having to generalize, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, kind of forcing but, but at any rate progressivism is uh, so it's a part and parcel of trade unionism trade unionism is not any kind of special departure from from the progressive point of view in in politics is it well the whole word progressive you know has changed meanings over the course of the 20th century and to the present I mean, the whole word itself has come to mean different things. So, you know, in the early 20th century, the progressive era, roughly 1890 to World War I, that's what I call the progressive era. Uh, progressivism even then was, was a complicated thing, but in general, uh, it involved uh, a, a concern uh, to improve the quality of life, uh, the very first proposals for things like Social Security were developed at that time. A, a concern uh, among some progressives uh, to foster the trade union movement, um, especially coming out of John Commons at the University of Wisconsin seeking to uh, legitimize trade unions as an important component in in a in a fair economy um always within progressivism you found though currents that could move in in very different directions so um it, it's so hard to uh, for me to generalize as to where how how did these swirling currents of the early 20th century lead to events in the 30s or, or later? Mm -hmm. I mean, you certainly see some of the threads of the New Deal coming out of progressivism, but you also see some very different patterns. You know, when you, you've re just reminded me of something that William Luchtenberg said to us in, in the class at Columbia when I was a graduate student, uh, a lecture class on the New Deal. And he said, if if the typical progressive was Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt standing at Armageddon and battling for the Lord, the typical New Dealer was Harry Hopkins chain smoking at a racetrack. <laughs> Which is to say that there was a really moralistic flavor to the early progressive movement that had been pretty much taken out by the time it got to the New Deal. Mm. And what was left was some of the things that today we would think of as social justice. Mm -hmm. But that term, again, is, is a more modern term. And of course, one of those things was to legitimize the trade union movement in a way that it had been delegitimized in the 1920s. So there had been an effort in the progressive era to, to legitimize unions. And then the 20s had seen that rolled back. In the 30s, there was an effort to, to change all of that. And of course, more recently, since the administration of Ronald Reagan, most obviously, we've seen many trade union efforts delegitimized, beginning with the air traffic controllers mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Taft-Artley Act even before that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. putting all kinds of restraints on the union movement so that unionized workers today have such a small percentage of the total workforce compared to what it was at its peak in the 1950s. 
Well, uh, that was a fantastic answer to a really cruel question. <laughs> this has all been very uh, fascinating discussion that we've been having with the historian uh, Robert Robert Cherney. We could go on for hours uh, with these some of these topics. Uh, you know, I just wrote down a little list of things I wanted to make sure I um, asked uh, uh, Robert before we uh, before we finished up, and I only got about twenty percent of the way. Through the <laughs> through the list, so so this could go on and on, but we absolutely have to conclude. And so thanks to Robert Cherney for an illuminating, fascinating uh, uh, discussion, and a goodbye to um, uh, viewers of Glassnos until next time, when we will continue to ask the question: After we've tried everything else, why don't we try thinking about it? <laughs>